Hi everyone, uh, this is Patrick Wendell here, and uh, this is a talk about tuning and debugging in uh, in Apache Spark. This is a a conference talk I gave a few days ago, and I'm recording it in this sort of screencast format. I'm interested in feedback on whether people think this is a useful uh, format, and uh, please leave comments in the video uh, one way or the other whether you think it's useful. Just a, a couple words about myself. Um, I'm an Apache Spark committer. Um, I'm a PMC member, and I, I frequently do the release management for Spark. I worked on Spark uh, in the UC Berkeley days. That was uh, uh, many years ago, but when the project was kind of starting. And, um, and today, I, I am managing most of the Spark work that we do at Databricks. A little bit about uh, Databricks, just one slide. This company was uh, created by the um, sort of founders of the Spark project in 2013. We donated Spark to the ASF as one of the first things we did after we started the company. Um, so, so now it's sort of governed under the Apache Foundation, but uh, we remain the largest contributor uh, and, and sort of most active uh, company in the Spark uh, ecosystem today. And our product is an end-to-end -end cloud service called Databricks Cloud. Uh, that's not the focus of this talk, but you'll get to see it a little bit uh, uh, as part of a demo. And the goal with Databricks Cloud is really to kind of build the uh, easiest place to get up and running with Spark uh, with, with kind of little or no uh, upfront investment since it's a, a cloud service. So the goal of this presentation is really to help you uh, as a Spark user understand and, be and better kind of debug your programs. Um, and and also to offer a few tips on tuning and performance that are not maybe totally obvious for um, beginner users. And I've structured this talk in a way where I assume that you know basic concepts from Spark, that you understand the RDD API, and that we can then go just a little bit deeper than that kind of first uh, that first level. Um, so if you're a newer user, you may want to kind of read up on Spark or, or write a few example programs before uh, reading or listening to this talk because I'm going to move pretty quickly on the beginner material. So I'm going to start by talking for a, a very good amount of time, maybe half of the whole talk about the execution model in Spark and, and what's really happening under the hood when you run uh, Spark programs. So you might ask why, you know, why is this the main focus when it's it's really supposed to be a, a debugging and tuning talk. And uh, the main reason, and you may not get this joke, uh, I, I delivered this talk at a conference where President Obama uh, gave a, a quick kind of keynote. So um, I was uh, joking that he also said this, but it was cut, uh, uh, ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, mm -hmm. the, the key to really being confident and able to tune uh, Spark applications is really understanding what's going on under the hood. This is true about anything. I mean, if you want to be really good at fixing cars, you know, you need to understand how engines work and so forth. So, um, so a lot of this talk will focus on just going a little bit deeper on what's going on inside of Spark for that reason. And I think the real question we want to, to go over is kind of, uh, and something users ask about a lot is, if I have a Spark program, you know, I wrote I wrote my code, uh, the API I can understand. It compiles down into some uh, some execution um, uh, terminology like stages and tasks. But you know, how is this? What is the actual correspondence between things that I get instrumentation about in the Spark UI and what I've written? It's not always obvious to people kind of how that compilation happens. So that's going to be a, a big focus. So let's start with the user facing API and. Um, I'm assuming people are comfortable with this, but the main abstraction in Spark is this thing called an RDD. It's, a, it's essentially a big uh, distributed collection of records. And you can create them from sort of on-disk storage systems from uh, in many different ways. In this example, we're creating an RDD by just uh, parallelizing a local collection um, using the, the parallelize operator in Spark. <clears throat> and once we have an RDD, we can transform it into existing or from existing RDDs into new ones. So there's this thing called transformations, and that gives me back just another data set that's derived in some way logically from the one I had before. So a simple transformation is filter. OK, I've taken the RDD, I filtered it uh, using this, this sort of function that I passed you, and I'm filtering just lines that have error in them. When I get back is, what I get back is just this thing called errors, which is also an RDD. And then the other main um, sort of API operator type in Spark is called an action. And that's something that actually materializes a value or causes some side effect to happen. Um, it's not just giving me back a new RDD. So in this example, we have the count action. So 
I'll go walk through kind of an example user program uh, that uses both transformations and actions, and then this program will become the basis of, uh, of uh, or, or we'll deep dive a little deeper into this program in, in the next slides. So in this program, we say that we have an input file. So I, that's the red box at the top right. This is something called input.txt, and it has some, uh, it's some server logs. So you know, it has a bunch of log messages in each line, and, um, and the log message format is a level of severity, so like info, warning, et cetera, and then um, a, a message that follows. <clears throat> And um, what, let's look at what the program does. So first, we read the uh, the file using text file. That's um, basically a way to read from Hadoop style inputs. So this could be a big file in HDFS or S3 or wherever. And then we tokenize uh, because the, the, what I'm actually going to try to answer with this very short program is I actually want to do a count for each of the types of, of severity levels of how many uh, I saw across my entire maybe potentially very large data set. So I want to know how many info, warning, and error uh, messages were there. So I'm going to do it in a few stages. First, I'm going to tokenize, have this uh, RDD tokenized that um, splits each entry into individual words. And then it also does a filter where it says, look, if there was no words, you can see the third line in this input just is empty. I want to just get rid of those because those are going to screw up my downstream processing. And then I create another RDD counts where I start with this tokenized. I run the map function again and, uh, and extract sort of emit a, a single um, counter, just a, a one for each um, you know, first element. And then I uh, reduce by key, because now I have a key value RDD. <coughs> and I add up uh, all of the sort of corresponding components. I add up all of the counts. So then it, globally, this will do a reduce, which will give me back like exactly how many total uh, records there are for each of this type. So if this program is not uh, understandable to you, I would just uh, go ahead and, and look at the Spark programming guide or something. But I'm going to assume that you uh, can kind of get this program. And uh, w the question is, you know, how does Spark interpret this? What what does the underlying execution engine do with this? And and how is this viewed in terms of the kind of internal details of Spark? So to to show that, what I'm going to do is a few things. So first, I'm just going to take out all of the specific arguments, uh, like the actual functions that were passed, that don't have to do with the real logical structure of the program. Because from in Spark's perspective, those are, are sort of um, handled. In a, they're not fundamental to the way that the, the program is compiled. OK, so all I did was just erase a bunch of uh, function arguments. And then as a next step, uh, I'm just going to write this as a single chained set of calls. What we did in the program is we created these intermediate variables, and then we we called functions on them. But uh, but in reality, to Spark, um, you know, every single one of these function calls, uh, transformation calls, has a pointer to the RDD which was transformed, and so it's kind of logically a single uh, a set of of sort of relationships being created. And then uh, I'm gonna I still haven't really done anything too huge to our original program. Um, I'm going to just draw out the individual RDDs that are being created uh, for each of these operations. So you can see at the beginning, there's like this thing called Hadoop RDD that's created. Um, and, uh, and there's also, then we map and filter, and eventually we do a reduce by key, which creates something called a shuffle RDD. Now, a couple of things to note here. So one is that whereas before I said RDDs are a collection of objects, in this picture of the world, there's kind of another level of, of uh, hierarchy, which is that RDDs have something called partitions. And a partition in Spark um, is something that's sort of exposed in the user API, but it's really more of an internal concept. And it's just a subset of the elements in the RDD, and it's used as kind of a unit of parallelism when we're doing computation. So uh, as a good example, when you have a Hadoop RDD that you load a, a piece of data from Hadoop using text file or some other similar operator, um, we're going to create a new RDD, and that RDD is going to have one partition per uh, input block, which is already a way that in the Hadoop world, they chunk files up into smaller units. So, um, so that's kind of the built-in notion of partitioning in Hadoop RDD. And then other types of uh, RDDs have their own way of defining partitioning, uh, which I'll go into a little bit um, in a minute. One other thing to notice is that if you look at the bottom here, uh, I showed that like we didn't create references to every RDD in our program. We uh, we created a, a variable that re referred to the Hadoop RDD. It was called input, and then we also created a variable tokenized and another one counts. 
But those other RDDs were sort of implicitly created um, when we did these chaining operations. So, so just to point out that you know you may not have a reference to every single RDD that exists in your program, but they do exist there under the hood, and, and Spark is aware of them by virtue of these pointers that we track internally when you create new RDDs. So Spark's internal scheduler can see this. This is the, the view of the world. Now, I talked about transformations, and what they do is they kind of chain together RDDs to build up. In this case, it's just a single sort of line of RDDs and their parents, but, um, but it can be even a more general DAG. But they don't actually do anything. Uh, they just, it's only a, a, a sort of building up of a logical uh, execution plan. And if you ran the code that I've given you so far in the Spark shell, um, it would just like sit there and return to you immediately. So the way it works in Spark is that evaluation of this DAG of, of sort of logical data sets you've defined is, is lazy. And the thing that uh, sort of causes them to come into action um, is, is something called uh, what we usually call actions. But I actually want to forget about the term actions um, and actually talk about a slightly lower level concept, which is very closely related, which is a method in Spark called run job. What run job is, is the single sort of very narrow interface between a bunch of the logical parts of Spark that deal with defining what an RDD is, what its partitions are, how you compute it, and the lower level physical execution. So there's thousands of functions in Spark. This is probably one of the most important ones. And the interface is fairly straightforward. So the interface to run job is the following. I give you an RDD. So this RDD itself maybe has ancestors or something as we saw. I give you a set of partitions that I want to compute, and then I give you a function that you, you know, Spark, is going to call on every single partition, the full materialized final output of every partition. And then your, what RunJob gives you back is it gives the caller a array with the kind of result of that function for every single, um, for every single partition. So just as a really simple example, um, think about, uh, I can explain, there's a, a function called save as Hadoop dataset in Spark. And it just takes whatever RDD is at this point in the DAG and it will write it all out to HDFS. And the way that that works internally is it calls run job, it calls it on a, the, whatever RDD you've invoked save as dataset on, and it, the function that is passed is one that reads through all of the data in the final sort of materialized partition of that RDD and writes it out to HDFS. So it only really exists for a side effect. And then it may return some uh, sort of status value or something like that back to the caller. So I'll give more examples, but I just want to say, uh, kind of point out that run job is really this important narrow interface. And it corresponds to what you see in the Spark UI as what's called a job. So that's why it's, in, it's kind of useful to know, even as uh, just a user of Spark. So I like to think of it as uh, like when Picard says, make it so, you know, you've kind of come up with this whole plan and now you're going to uh, enact it. Now, how does this work logically? So what Spark needs to do when you call run job, you said, I have one of these RDDs in my graph and now I want to finally compute it. Well, logically what it needs to do is it needs to compute that RDD's parents, its parents, parents, et cetera, all the way back to an RDD that had no dependencies that were within you know, RDD land. So for instance, the input RDD was from Hadoop. I know how to get that from nothing. I can just, uh, it can compute itself just from uh, a Hadoop data source. So in this example, let's just assume we're calling run job on counts. That's the final RDD in our little program that hopefully will give us the counts for each log level. And um, don't even worry about what user function I'm passing to run job. Uh, this, this is going to be true of any type of, uh, of action or, or um, inv invocation of run job, regardless of what it's doing. So let's say we call that. Okay, so logically what needs to happen? Well, Spark needs to somehow compute you know, this chain of RDDs, each of which has some partitions all the way back to the input. Now, the very naive way to do this uh, would be to you know, literally separately compute and store every single one of these RDDs. So for instance, you'd first read all the data from Hadoop, you'd do one map function on it, and then you'd write that data out. Then you'd read it all back in, do a filter on it, write all that out, etc. So that would be a correct way to implement uh, what the user is asking for, which is I just want to sort of run a job on the very final RDD. But because Spark uses lazy execution, uh, we can do something a lot smarter than that. 
So what we can do is we can exploit things we know about this graph to execute it in a more efficient way. And those are called physical optimizations. There are sort of two big ones uh, that you, you'll run into a lot. And these are things that make your job run much faster. They're also things that can be a little bit confusing for users because it means the physical execution is kind of different than the thing that you built up logically. So there's two kind of main things. One is that you can pipeline certain types of transformations, which I'll explain on the next slide. And the other one is that if you've already cached or persisted RDDs at some point, or even if they were just involved in a shuffle where we end up persisting some of them, then Spark can kind of smartly truncate the graph. We don't need to keep going back and back and back and computing earlier ones. We can just start there and move forward towards what you're trying to get. Um, so once these things occur, you end up with the kind of more familiar Spark UI version of work, which is called stages and tasks. And I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in a second. So in this example for run job, you know, just the same example I had before, I, I kind of lied to you about the way that one thing works or I oversimplified it. When a, an RDD keeps track of its parents, it doesn't just have a, a sort of simple pointer to the parent. It actually like stores a little bit of other metadata in there that explains something about the relationship between it and its parents. And specifically, uh, there are two types of dependencies. One of them is called a narrow dependency, and one of them is called a wide or a shuffle dependency. So in this example, narrow dependencies are where there's just a simple arrow between partitions of this RDD and of its parent. And a shuffle or a wide dependency is when it's more complex. So logically, what this, this means is that in order to compute an RDD for a narrow dependency, I, only, I can do it sort of in place. There, needs, there does not need to be any data movement. I can safely kind of pipeline these things. For instance, if I'm uh, doing a map and a filter, I can kind of put those into one operation, and I can just run it individually on each partition without having to, to worry about its correctness. In contrast, a, a wide dependency is one where I, um, I may need to move data around in order to compute an RDD from its parents. So for instance, when I do this final uh, sort of counting by key, well, it could be that there, there may be, you know, I'm doing some aggregation basically, and, and there may be lines with the word error in them in multiple different partitions, and I'm trying to do a final global count. So hopefully it's intuitive that at some point I'll need to shuffle and move data around in order to do that. So the main reason why it's helpful to store this metadata is that Spark can exploit this to make uh, your job run faster. So what it will do is that all of things that have narrow dependencies between them can get sort of glommed together into one physical unit of execution uh, in a way that uh, significantly improves performance over that really naive version that I said before, where we just kind of compute each one together. So in, in this example, uh, that type of pipelining that's kind of the first optimization, will result in this uh, whole thing taking two stages to execute. So it actually will end up looking like this, because all of those narrow things we could just collapse, all those maps and filters, we just put them logically into one sort of function that's going to do all, the map and the filter, et cetera, they're, they're all those chained calls. So what it's going to look like is it'll have two physical stages. OK, so one stage, each task will read the Hadoop input, perform that sequence of maps and filters, and write out some partial sums for each partition. That's kind of embedded in the reduce by key operator, what it's doing. And in, for the other stage, it's going to read the partial sums. These are like the counts per log level. And it will then invoke whatever, you know, th that will allow it to kind of compute the final partition. And then it will invoke whatever user function was passed to run job. So, um, so as I, you know, if you remember, I didn't really tell you what what we're doing with run job. So, so it doesn't even matter. This is just kind of for any action we run on this final RDD. This is how it will compute that RDD, and then it will invoke whatever the user function is. So now we can start to talk about terminology you'll see in the Spark UI, and with a little bit of a better understanding of, of what does it mean to be a stage and what does it mean to be a task. And so I, so I can kind of see now what these things come from. One thing I actually realized I, I didn't explicitly call out is that we've now introduced this, thing, this notion of tasks. And tasks will correspond to individual partitions of potentially multiple RDDs. So uh, you know, a single task will operate on one Hadoop input split, but then it may do also these kind of subsequent operations that were not defined in Hadoop RDD, it was defined over a series of RDDs.
So a couple of things that you'll see in the UI, one is input read. That's like if I'm reading from an external data source for each partition that we have in this pipeline task, um, how much like data did I read in? Uh, another familiar metric is shuffle write and shuffle read. And that has to do with when data movement occurs because there's an RDDs that relate to each other in a way that requires that movement, um, we store like how much data is output and how much is then fetched on the second physical stage. So to kind of recap a little bit, the terminology you see in the Spark UI is tied to physical execution, not only the logical structure of your program. So job, as displayed in the UI, is the work required to compute a, a single RDD when you invoke one instance of run job. Stages are these kind of waves of work with many parallel tasks that correspond to some set of RDDs that were pipelined. Maybe it's only one, maybe it's more if we chain together some filters and maps and other things like that. And tasks are this lowest level unit of work within a stage that correspond to one partition, one sort of logical unit of parallelism. And then the shuffle is the transfer of data between stages for certain types of uh, RDD relationships where we need a shuffle, like things that do global grouping and, and ordering and stuff like that. So you might ask like, okay, great, you know, I watched this talk and now I saw for that example how the physical graph comes out of the logical one, but what about in, I'm doing my own prototyping in the shell or I'm doing some my own Spark program? So for that, we do have an operator called 2DebugString, which will print out a fairly nice list of all of the dependencies of an RDD. So these are things that will need to be computed if you invoke an, an action on this RDD. And it even shows you by using indentation where there's going to be a boundary uh, between things that can be pipelined and things that can't be. And the numbers in parentheses indicate uh, the sort of parallelism level at each step in this kind of physical plan the, for each stage. So I'm going to describe now, um, let me just, yeah, yeah. I'm going to describe now how uh, certain actions, as you've sort of learned about when learning the Spark API, are defined in terms of run job. And the first one I'll do is the count action. It's a very uh, sort of common action. You just want to count how many things are in the RDD. Well, in order to count it, I really do need to materialize it because I need to learn you know, how many records it has. And that may be dependent on different operations and filters that happened beforehand. So the way that count works, and this is like really just how it works, there's very little extra stuff that I'm not showing you, is that it calls run job. It gives to run job just itself because count is just an operator on an RDD. Run job is a little more general, so you could invoke it even on you know a different RDD that's not you. But in count is just an RDD operator, so it invokes run job. It just gives it itself. The, you know I'm the thing you need to materialize. It says every partition because I want to count the entire thing. Just just go and materialize all of my partitions. And what it does with the result is that it computes its size. That will just kind of do it, go in a streaming fashion through an iterator and add up the size. And then, as I, I said earlier, run job gives me kind of the result for every single one of the RDDs that I computed. And, uh, and what I, or sorry, for every single one of the partitions I computed. And so what I need to do at the end is I need to take all of those and sum them. So this will do kind of per partition counts and then sum them, and you can return that to the caller. And that is actually how count is implemented. There's uh, another uh, action, which I'm not going to go into detail and, and explain every bit of this code, but I just wanted to explain that one thing some users find confusing is that certain actions may trigger multiple jobs. Um, it's, it's almost never the case. It's usually one-to-one, -one, but there are cases where a single action will trigger multiple jobs, and one of them is the take action. So what take does is it says, look, I want to sort of you, I want you to give me a few elements of this RDD. Maybe the RDD has billions of records or, or it's a, some huge data set, but I only want to take maybe 10 of those because I'm, you know, let's say I'm prototyping in the shell and I just want to play around with a, a small sample. So a very naive way to implement take would be to, let's say, you know, compute every single partition of the RDD, write all of it out somewhere, and then just grab a few of the outputs. But uh, that requires materializing a lot of state, and uh, it's something that we can do a little bit better on. So what Spark actually does is that it creates a little temporary buffer for results, and it actually steps through individual partitions one at a time, and first just computes that partition, 
then it sees if it got enough data to meet the user. You know, the user asked for some specific number, so it sees if it got enough of in that number, and then it will keep doing this for subsequent partitions until it kind of gets enough. And this can help a lot. If you have an RDD that only has kind of narrow dependencies all the way back to some storage system, like you're reading from Hadoop, and then you do some filters, and you do some small transformations, and then you just take 10, it will only have to go and ever even read one piece of input from Hadoop. It won't have to go and scan potentially very large data set. So don't worry too much about kind of the specifics of this code here, but I just wanted to give you a sense of like sometimes you can have multiple jobs that show up in the UI, but they're related only to one uh, action. Doesn't, it's not the normal case, but it does happen. Okay, so now I'm going to do a quick demo, and um, I'm actually going to, I had something on the slide here, but I'm going to do it inside of uh, Databricks Cloud. And I've just created a, a notebook here. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. So first I generated some example data, and I'm not going to run through this because I already did it, but I just created some random uh, log messages in a Hadoop file and saved it. So now I'll get to the, the user code. So this is literally just the code I wrote on that slide verbatim. I'm just going to step through. So first I'm going to create this input RDD. Then I'm going to uh, go through the step that tokenizes and extracts, uh, filters out sort of empty records. Um, then I'm going to go to create the final counts RDD, which hopefully will give us um, give us the sort of log messages levels with their counts. And then I'm going to call collect on it. So collect is an action. It's, in fact, it's an action that just goes and computes every part of the RDD and gives it all back, back to you at the sort of driver program where you're calling it. And then for each of those, I'm just going to invoke, this is just a Scala for each that prints, prints out the output. You could do this in Java or Python or R APIs as well. So I'm just going to run that. OK, so that actually was, this thing had maybe 10, um, let's see, maybe 100,000 uh, records. So it was very, very small. But it still ran quite fast. Uh, and we have, now we can see like, OK, we had you know this many errors and this much info and warning and debug. So that's kind of what I wanted. And let's look at, in the Spark UI, how this manifested itself. So I have my Spark UI, and oh, I realized I ran another job earlier that is making it more confusing. But it's saying that the most recent job I ran is this thing where I, you know it just actually tells me this is a little bit of Databricks magic, but I think it's very similar in the the, the sort of vanilla Spark shell. Um, it's telling me that yeah, this is from a collect, and uh, let's go look at the job. So if I go and look at the job, this is a, a little cramped because I've zoomed in here for clarity. Um, let me just zoom out a little bit more. It will show me exactly what I said before, which is, oh, look, I have two stages. Uh, this stage says map. This stage says collect. I'll go over that in a second. The first stage had some input from Hadoop. It had some shuffle write. And then it had uh, the second stage had shuffle read, which then read those kind of partial uh, sums. And the parallelism, the first one was three, because that was sort of the number of splits in the Hadoop. Uh, the second one is two. I actually explicitly gave this level of parallelism when I did the reduce by key. And it's just giving me two stages that I can then go drill down and see for each of the tasks in this stage what was going on. I'm not going to walk through everything that's displayed in this UI. There's a lot of cool instrumentation. But hopefully, uh, being able to understand where that is coming from uh, is helpful to you. So one thing I did want to point out is how are these stages named? So the, the name is the operator here, right at the blue link. So for stages that are an RDD being materialized as part of run job, they're named for the action that I invoked that called run job. So run, run job. So in this case, that's the collect action. For stages that were a dependency of another RDD through transformations at one of these kind of boundaries that we create when we pipeline, uh, that is named after the RDD that is kind of the last one before the shuffle boundary occurs. So right now this says console colon 26 because it's in a shell. If you're in your user program, it will give you the exact line number where that RDD was created. So then you can go back and look at your code and kind of understand, OK, yeah, this is where this thing was coming from. So I think we'll probably end there for this little look in the UI. But basically, the, the long and short of it is you have a jobs page which tells you kind of what are the jobs that have run and how are they doing or ones that are in progress. And you can drill down for each of the individual jobs to see stages. And you can drill down into those to see tasks. So let's get back to the, um, to the talk. So 
that was really the first big goal of this whole talk was to give you a way to understand sort of the physical execution and the terminology used there and how it relates to the, the logical thing that you wrote in your program, which was more about kind of uh, uh, declaratively saying what you wanted to happen. So for the second half of the talk, the, what, one good news is, even if you didn't follow every single aspect of that, the second half of the talk is, is sort of uh, uh, largely independent and you should be able to still get a lot of what's coming. So the second thing is just a kind of survey of things that I have seen impact performance in production Spark workloads. And um, not all of these will impact every uh, workload, but I think a lot of them will be broadly relevant. So this is kind of a, a performance checklist, maybe you would say, or a list of things that can um, influence performance. So uh, the number one determinant of performance is often the amount of data that is shuffled inside of a Spark job. So as I kind of mentioned before, shuffle is the main um, data movement that occurs at the physical level in Spark. And in general, if you avoid shuffle, it, your program will typically run faster. A very common way to do that is to make sure you're using built-in aggregation support in Spark instead of, for instance, uh, doing a very large shuffle with a group by and then doing your own aggregation. Uh, there are some other talks that cover this, so I'm not going to uh, go into tons of detail. Um, this was covered in another talk the same day as, as I delivered this talk, which is why that's mentioned on this slide. But um, there's, there's sort of various ways of just making sure you prune and decrease the amount of data that moves over the, the shuffle. Um, another uh, key issue can be the degree of parallelism. So as I said before, there's kind of this notion of partitioning that's very innate in RDDs. And um, in Spark, we've more and more tried to infer the level of parallelism to use uh, for you. Um, and that's something that will continue in future versions of Spark. Um, but nonetheless, there are still pathological cases where you can have a huge performance increase by uh, tweaking this on your own. So I'm going to give an example. Uh, uh, let's say we read in some data from uh, an sc.txt file. That's, again, the way of reading from Hadoop. And I'm actually giving a, a path with a, a glob, a star in it. And so um, let's say that this is going to read from thousands of random gzip log files I have sitting in S3. In fact, if I get the number of partitions, uh, it's huge. It's like 35,000. This is just a ton, ton, ton of random files. And then uh, we'll assume that now I'm filtering this down. So I'm, uh, I'm calling filter, and I'm filtering down actually only, this is a folder of logs for an entire year. I'm filtering only one hour worth of logs. Um, and then, so you may ask, like, well, why didn't I just store the logs in the format where like, I, I had a folder for each uh, hour? And that is a very prudent way to do it. But sometimes you're given data sets that are ugly, and uh, you don't have control, and they're not organized nicely. And you actually need to brute force scan everything and just extract the records you want. And one nice thing about Spark is you can usually do that pretty quickly. So let's assume that the, the, the sort of uh, there's content from this hour potentially in any of those log files. So I, I run this filter. And if I, once I filtered, you know, Spark sees a filter as a narrow transformation. It's just going to apply that filter independently to each partition, and then it's going to give me back a list of partitions that have, you know, potentially way fewer log messages. So in a case like this where I know as a user that this filter is going to be extremely selective, maybe there's going to be thousands of partitions that end up just empty after the filter and other ones that have very small number of data, well, it can behoove me to explicitly tell Spark to scale this down into fewer partitions. And we can do that actually fairly efficiently using the coalesce operator, which sort of gloms together partitions. So if I want to do some subsequent cached analysis on this data, I can actually coalesce it down to maybe five partitions. Then I can cache that. And then when I do subsequent analysis, I'm operating on uh, a sort of more compact RDD. Now, why does that matter for performance, you might ask? Well, it turns out Spark is very efficient at launching tasks. Um, but nonetheless, if you're launching thousands of tasks to compute and operate on partitions that are totally empty, the overhead of just launching and scheduling those tasks is going to be significant. It's going to be maybe you know uh, several seconds or tens of seconds when, uh, if that had been coalesced down to five partitions, you could be talking the millisecond range. So, um, so this can definitely uh, help imp improve performance. And a little bit of a rule of thumb, because this goes in both directions, if you end up seeing that you have like tens of thousands of totally idle or mostly idle tasks, it can be good to coalesce. You can probably uh, avoid all that overhead if you have fewer partitions. By the way, if it turns out you're running tens of thousands of tasks and your job is still really fast anyway, then don't sweat it. I mean, performance optimization should occur when it's causing you a problem and not just for the, for the sake of it. So uh, Spark can handle huge volumes of tasks in a very short amount of time 
it's designed to be optimized for this. But nonetheless, if you're seeing this as a pain point, then yeah, go for it and do some tuning on your own. Also, on the other degree, if you find that your job is taking a long time and computing these partitions is taking a long time and you're not even using as many cores as you have in your cluster, for instance, maybe you're doing a very expensive operation uh, and you have only five partitions in this RDD, but you have a, a thousand cores in your cluster, well, sometimes calling repartition, which is this other operator in Spark, which will uh, sort of spread out the data into more partitions, can be a benefit to you. It is a little bit of a cost because you have to maybe shuffle and move some data around, but if the operation you're doing is expensive and you have extra capacity to parallelize it, it can be beneficial to call repartition and, uh, and spread it out more within your cluster. So again, these are like if you want to really go in the weeds and tune your thing to be as fast as possible, but in some cases they can make a large difference. Another issue is the choice of serializer. So, uh, so what is a serializer? A serializer is a way to take in-memory objects that are, in this case, JVM objects, and write them out to a byte stream uh, or encode them in a binary format that is recognizable to be, can be read and sort of returned back into objects. That's what serialization is. In Spark, we use it in a bunch of places. We use it in some cases when caching data. We also use it when uh, shuffling data, which as I mentioned is like the potentially most expensive thing inside of a Spark program. So, uh, so this is an area where users can often get a lot of performance improvement by just using an alternative to the default serializer. By default, we use Java's serializer, which is very robust. It can handle many, many types of inputs. Uh, but it is slow. There's a whole other serialization framework called Cryo, which Spark has built in support for. In fact, to use it, all you need to do is just set the setting spark.serializer to this other value to tell us to use Cryo. And optionally, you can uh, do another thing which makes Cryo even faster, which is you can add a little bit of boilerplate to your application to register explicitly every class you're going to use. This lets Cryo n avoid having to write the name of the class along with every object, which is like one of the largest overheads in serialization. Um, so if you, and if you turn on this setting I just gave you, then Cryo will actually force you to do that. So if it encounters a class you didn't register, it will throw an exception, which can be helpful if you're trying to step through and make sure you find every class you're using in a shuffle and register them. So almost all users will benefit from this change. It's only not the default because there's some corner cases where it doesn't work well and where Cryo will have trouble serializing objects. I would absolutely recommend turn this on, register your classes, and uh, you'll likely see a major improvement over what comes out of the box. Another uh, thing that can be uh, important for performance is, is caching formats. So uh, if you're caching intermediate data sets, which is common in Spark to avoid sort of having to recompute things many times, um, the default way of caching is that we use a storage level called memory only. So this means we're going to cache them as deserialized Java objects sitting around in the JVM. And that is, uh, is very fast because sort of scanning that is, is basically no cost. They're just sitting there already in your programming language runtime. But, um, but it can have some side effects. So one is that um, it can be worse for GC pressure because you have all these random objects sitting around inside of cache. And so storing them in a serialized format will actually take all of those, maybe thousands or millions of objects you're caching, serialize them into one large buffer, which is only one object from the perspective of the Java Virtual Machine Memory Manager, which is, is a huge performance improvement for GC. The only, the, the only trade-off of this is that it takes a little bit longer to access these because you need to deserialize serialize them on the fly as you go. So, uh, but if you are seeing GC issues and you're caching a lot of data, this can really help. Another thing you can do is you can cache using memory and disk storage level. And what that does is that it avoids, the, the default policy is if the cache space is getting uh, contended and, and you need to add new things, it will just drop the oldest one and we can always recompute it because of the data model in Spark, but it will not, it will not keep it around. Well, if you're reading data from, let's say, JDBC input or something where recomputing it could be really slow, uh, it can be beneficial to add memory and disk, which will actually just persist the thing to disk if there's contention. The only trade-off here is that in the current version of Spark, uh, writing out to disk can be itself a little bit of performance overhead. So you need to decide kind of which is worth it for you. But in some cases, like tweaking these uh, slightly can help you. There's also another option that both serializes and writes it out to disk. So th these aren't mutually exclusive. So a um, few other things here. So one is hardware. People often ask me, like, what's the best hardware to run Spark on? 
And the good news is like Spark is very resilient to many different types of hardware architectures and, and configurations. Because of the way it's architected, it does scale horizontally. Uh, and so in general, more is better. If you can add more cores, more memory, more um, more disks, then yes, yeah, Spark like will run faster and your jobs will complete more quickly. That's a nice property that not every system has. So um, so that's definitely true. You know, whether how you exactly size disks to um, to memory or CPU, it depends. If you want to really go crazy, it kind of depends what you're doing. If you're doing ML workloads that are just spinning tons of CPU and doing you know linear solvers and stuff like that that are expensive, then you might want to really uh, over provision CPU. If you're doing ETL workloads where the entire Spark cluster is devoted to reading huge data sets and uh, and transforming them and writing them back out you may want to optimize for having very large number of parallel disks. So it's really dependent on what you're doing. But Spark is very happy to just use some kind of standard balanced configuration that you may get as recommended by you know, your server provider. So uh, it's not something you need to stress about too much. One thing I'll add that's maybe not obvious is that it can often be good to limit the size of individual executors. Um, even if your machines, physical machines have tons of memory, just launch multiple executors. The reason why is that the data model in Spark is already such that it's everything's embarrassingly parallel. You don't get any benefit from having one huge heap compared to a few smaller heaps. And the cost is that the JVM does not like to deal with hundreds of gigabytes size of heaps. It makes garbage collection a much bigger issue. So, um, so in general, it can be beneficial to have sort of a, a smaller, a larger number of smaller executors. Maybe around 64 gigabytes is one reasonable size, and bin pack those into nodes. You pay a little bit of extra overhead for having uh, additional JVMs running, but that overhead is very, very modest. Uh, a couple of other just grab bag of things that I've seen influence people's performance. One is that. Uh, you may be able to get better performance by switching the default compression codec used during shuffles. So when we do this massive shuffle, not only do we serialize the data, but we also compress it uh, to improve performance. And um, our default compression codec is one, it's this library called Snappy Java. And we, we like it and it's the default because if you're doing a massive shuffle where you maybe have uh, you know, 100,000 partitions and uh, you're, you're potentially having to, to move data between many, many machines, Snappy has a little bit of better performance around memory uh, usage there. It's more conservative in how much memory it allocates per kind of partition. That is really only relevant for a small class of users. I am guessing that most users, if they switch to LZF, would actually see better performance uh, in their compression um, used during shuffle. So something, you know, it, you literally just change this value and see if your job runs faster, and if not, just forget about it. But it, it can help in some cases. Another thing that you can uh, look at is what's called speculative execution. So this is when you um, Spark, if it sees a task running slowly, it will launch another copy of the task and just let them race to see which one's finished. Everything in Spark is sort of item potent and immutable, so you can do this safely. Um, this is very useful if you're, for instance, in a large shared yarn cluster and some nodes have some crazy other workload from some other team that you don't even know, and it's causing that node to thrash and be really out of control. Well, if you end up having some of your tasks scheduled there, you can just speculate, launch them on another node, and you can forget about the really slow ones. Because these really slow tasks can, can often hurt the performance of a single job a lot, because it's kind of you have to wait till the very last one finish. On the other hand, if you're in a very tightly controlled cluster where it's kind of your dedicated thing and you, you understand all the hardware and it's maybe only order 20 to 100 nodes, then um, this can have some extra cost because you're kind of wasting utilization just launching extra copies of random tasks. So it may not be beneficial for you. But it's worth turning it on and seeing if you get any performance benefit. The last uh, of these smaller things is that you want to make sure Spark for shuffling has as many disks as possible because it will, if memory runs out, stripe shuffle output across disks when it's moving all this data. Um, you set this in standalone and mesos mode by setting this environment variable, spark locoders, and you just give a comma separated list. You want to ideally give uh, directories that are in different are on different physical disks and give you know give us as many of those as you have disks. In Yarn mode, we learn about directories from Yarn's built-in infrastructure for uh, providing these locations. So that just goes to how you configure your Yarn cluster, but it, more is always better. I also recommend maybe not using the same disks that you're using for HDFS to uh, minimize contention. 
Um, at the end of the day, if you don't have that many disks, you may have to do that. But if you can have dedicated shuffle directories or even better SSDs that Spark can use, then um, you're going to get much better shuffle performance. And again, shuffle is like a big, important part of the overall performance of a job. So with all that said, there's really one trick that can give you really good performance for very, very little cost. And that is to use uh, higher level APIs that is we are investing in in Spark and many of which are already available. So a big one is this new data frames API. We're, uh, we've just added in Spark 1.3, but will become a major focus in future versions. This is gonna work in all languages. It's a slightly higher level API and allows us to do lots of optimizations under the hood, both in the logical structure of the graph, like can we do join reordering and stuff, and also at the physical layer because we have a much better idea of the schema of the data that you're using. It's not just that you have random objects and you have your own serializer. So, um, so the more you can kind of move towards this higher level API, the better your performance will be. Another major issue for data frames is that the Python performance is identical to other languages, which is not true for the general PySpark API. Uh, other things are use the machine learning library instead of rolling your own machine learning implementation. Uh, that will you'll get all of the benefit of the tons of optimization the Spark core engineers already did. So a major reason why we've added this and the the SQL library is another example for kind of structured query processing is that if you use higher level APIs, you can punt all of this problem to us as the Spark engineers, and we can make sure we tune it in just the the perfect way. But at the end of the day, sometimes you do need to kind of use the lowest level core APIs. They are very flexible. And there, yeah, you can, you can often get wins by tweaking some of the things I've talked about in this talk. Also want to mention this talk was based uh, in a good, large part on a chapter that, that I actually wrote in the uh, recently released Learning Spark book. So check it out. It's chapter eight, Tuning and Debugging. It will go into a little bit more depth on the concepts that are in this talk, but it's very similar in spirit and you'll get it in the context of a, of a broader uh, education around Spark. So I definitely uh, recommend that. And, um, and last thing, we do have our own Spark conferences, and um, I don't know when you're looking at this video, this conference may have passed already, but uh, Spark Summit, the next one at the time of recording is Spark Summit 2015. It's uh, in June in San Francisco. There will be a lot of talks about internals and performance and all this kinds of stuff. Uh, so we'd love you to come, and, and if that one's passed, we'd love you to join us at future Spark Summit conferences in, uh, on the East Coast, in, in the Bay Area, and I think uh, eventually likely in Europe. Okay, so I, I can't take questions here because it's not interactive, but I hope that was useful for you. Um, please uh, leave comments on this video. Do you like this format? Could you, could you hear it well? And um, would you like to see more of these in the future? That, those are all things I'd love to get feedback on. Uh, thanks a lot, and um, I'll see you later and maybe at the next Spark conference. Cheers.